The way of the servant, living the light of Christ. Enlightenment, the final stage, as given through Jam. Preface. It is August 8, 1990, not far beyond a tiny town on the southwestern coast of the island of Hawaii. A narrow road winds down from the highway to a lovely little spot named Kokea. The coastline here is rugged. Battered cliffs of red and brown plunge from treeline to sea. There is a jetty of sorts that runs from the end of the northernmost cliff. A crude pile of boulders, it creates a shallow lagoon just right for small children to swim in. There is no white sand beach, and thank God, no throng of tourists baking in the delicious Hawaiian sun. Near the center of the park, a stream meanders through the dense foliage. Here I bathed yesterday, making my way far enough upstream to be out of sight. I dipped my body into the cool water, then sat on a rock, allowing the warm caress of a gentle breeze to dry me, breathing deeply the sweet fragrance of plumeria. Here in this magical spot that evokes memories of Eden from some forgotten place of the soul, meditation comes easily. In no time at all I feel a familiar place, as though I have come to the eye of the hurricane, the still point of the turning world. A familiar vibration. He is here, as though waiting for me to return home from a journey. He knocks gently, assuredly, on the door of my heart. I enter, turning my attention to him and him alone. It is time for us to begin our second work together. For this did I suggest a notebook. He refers to a small red binder that I impulsively threw onto my shopping cart a few days ago. Use this solely for our communication. The publication of the Jeshua letters is now imminent. A series of events, none of which I could have imagined, would begin with a month that did indeed lead to that book's publication. Again, I suggest that you continue in your learning of trust. It is not important that you see how all things will be accomplished. Remember to the world the awakened mind seems naive. But the opinions of those who believe what is real is not, and what is not real, it surely should not be heeded. I am distracted. The mosquitoes have won. Sighing, I rise from the rock, dress, and return to camp. One of the reasons I love Hawaii so much is this moment. The sun is long since set, replaced by a bright full moon. It illuminates trees and rocks and ocean waves while painting cloud edges in silver white, and still it is warm. Warm enough to lay there undressed, drinking in the energies of this place deep in every cell. As again I feel his presence within me, a thought of amazement arises in my mind. He is continuing our conversation now as if there was no break in our communication. The simple fact is a gentle reminder that time is somehow not quite what I have learned it is. And he speaks. I see it, the title, The Way of the Servant, Living the Light of Christ. For the first shall be the last, and the last first. This teaching was not intended for use. It has been given by those who would find in me justification for the judgment of their brothers and sisters. That which is called the sacred book of your Bible does, in fact, contain many seeds of wisdom. However, these have often been separated from their original context and woven into stories designed to serve not the Holy Father, but the conception of God the mind in separation would long for. I gave this teaching to those known as my disciples. Its meaning serves as a the theme of this present work, for when the mind is truly awakened from the dream of separation, and the soul is returned to its only reality as a son of God, there comes then a new beginning. No longer is there futile searching for what the world cannot offer or hope to contain. Abiding in that peace which forever passes understanding, the soul is at rest. It neither desires the things of the world nor judges them. It learns the sublime art of what has been called waiting on the Lord. This merely means that the soul moves in accordance with the Father's will, and can no longer consider doing otherwise. The soul dons the cloak of the servant. The way emerges for us, when the acknowledgment of your reality as the only begotten Son of God is accomplished, and the Armageddon between this reality and the habit of useless dreams is ended. The journey to the kingdom is completed, and the journey within it begins. The whole of creation is reclaimed as one's own, and the soul's only desire is that creation be restored as a reflection of the holy thought of God, who is but love. Love is a radiant splendor forever shining beyond all appearance, a splendor held as a distant memory in the heart of all forms of life, and it is this that life strains to rediscover. When this is accomplished, the very purpose of creation will be completed, and the things of heaven and earth shall pass away, as mist before the rising sun. In this work I shall address the meaning of servantship, for here it is found the highest calling of the soul, as well as the final enactment possible in the field of manifestation. True servantship is not in any way possible, while yet there lingers hope for salvation in the things of the world, including those ideas of salvation which cleverly conceal the fear that is ego, the dream of the separate self that can gain or lose. I will clarify the true nature of the servant, as well as the qualities of genuine service. We will journey through the field of obstacles which keep the highest joy just beyond the grasp of the one who would join in union with God. 
Know this, nothing ever imagined by the mind of man can bring the soul such depth of peace, such breadth of fulfillment, such heights of unspeakable joy as conservantship. Enlightenment, when fully realized, gives birth to the servant as surely as does the flower burst forth from the seed well planted and nurtured. Contemplate deeply what is here being spoken, again and yet again, in the quiet of solitude. For these words I have chosen deliberately, taking them deep in your heart will hasten your consummate approaching. This work is given to assist those who will soon touch the heart of a perfect remembrance. It is a great truth that greater works than mine shall you who serve love bring forth into the world in these last days. Herein is the introduction completed. After giving the introduction, he suggested I be patient because this work would come in the form of an appropriate time. He also asked that I keep the little red notebook close at hand, and I agreed. I had no way of knowing then that three years would pass before he would finish it. The process of writing was actually quite simple. I dragged the notebook with me wherever I went, lived my life, and waited. Sometimes several months would go by with so much as a mention of this work from him. At times he literally stopped in mid-sentence, only to pick it up later, as if there had been no interruption. Waking me at two or three in the morning with that familiar little vibration in my heart continued to be one of his apparently favorite times. Finally, I grew accustomed to the fact that he might never finish it at all. I confess that my wife occasionally enjoys telling friends how I threw the notebook across the room when the words I was scribing pushed my buttons or convenient left it on a friend's table, forgetting that I had done with it. In fact, when he dictated the final pages and said amen, it failed to sink in that it was done. I got out of my chair to head to the kitchen, suddenly stopped in my tracks and muttered, It's done. No more little red notebook. Alan Cohen, in his forward to the Jeshua letters, called Jeshua a masterful teacher. Looking back, this one simple fact becomes abundantly clear. The way of the servant is a link in an exquisite tapestry being woven by this loving master, always dedicated to awaken us all to the present reality of love, beyond our fears and hurts, angers and doubts. The way of the servant, like a good painting, reveals its treasure to you the longer you linger with it. It has pushed my deepest buttons, shown me where my own ego games continue, requiring my attention. It has become an ever-present reminder that he is with us all always, overflowing with the love we are choosing to remember on this planet. We offer it to you as it was offered to us. If you choose, it will become a blessing on your journey, a constant companion writing your course whenever, for a fleeting moment, you are tempted to be distracted by the voice of the world that seems to have made a home in your mind. As this gift from Jeshua has done so many times, may it also serve to turn your ear to the gentle voice that yet lives within us all, the voice which speaks only of love, of what we are together forever, streams of joy. J.M. Ubud Bali, April 2006 Book 1. Servantship. It appears an odd word, yet within it lies the meaning of sacrifice, of love, of true being. Servantship is a vocation to which one is called, not by a God who exists apart from you, but by that one true God who abides eternally in the hearts of one's heart, and is forever the souls of one's soul. For the one true God is your only reality, and in this does the recognition dawn that you, who would insist on the smallness of yourself as you have dreamt it to be, contain in truth all wisdom. That you contain all perfections holy men would so diligently seek, and ignorant men would mistakenly seek in the destination of their worldly dreams. That one true God, to whom you are eternally united, so that no boundary between you can be distinguished, is that which has sustained the infinite forms of your dreams, their incessant creation fueled by the one thought of separation. And now, in the time of recognition, after the allure of the dream has paled and finally lost all trace of significance, and in that perfect silence, where the sleeping sun no longer rebels against the simple and loving embrace of the Holy Father, the light of the living Christ is rekindled. As a flame in a windless place, its light grows ever brighter, dissolving all traces of the shadows which have kept it hidden, lighting up the dark places where the dust which is the world has settled, even until the dust is dissolved and becomes as light itself. The doer is undone, the maker of the world is unmade, and Christ again lives. Here the end of all fruitless journeying, here the ceasing of all strife, here the realization of the only truth, beyond all utterance, beyond the understanding of the world, beyond even the dream of the one who would seek God. For the seeker is no more, as if he had never been, save as a fading memory of a dream dreamt long ago. Return to the embrace of our Holy Father, 
the one who is returned acknowledges, I am that one. Christ lives, and Christ alone. As it is, has been, and forever shall be. The awakened heart is likened unto one who is journeying to the summit of the highest mountain. Here she looks out upon the distant, traveled, the many landscapes stretching out below her, the seemingly infinite shapes and hues. She beholds all the worlds of mankind and sees them as empty, as a moment's diversion, fragrance of but one dream. She beholds herself as the one dreamer, and she would that every vestige of herself be nudged from sleep to waking. And now the transformation is completed. Resting in the light of remembrance, embraced eternally in the arms of his Father, the only begotten Son abides in the kingdom, prepared for him in the most ancient beginning before time is. Her will has become as her Father's, united again as one. The first movement of that divine will stirs in the vision before her. Compassion arises for the whole of creation, and she sees without effort the task set before her. The awakening of the whole of herself now recognizes every soul, every blade of grass, every wisp of breeze. Awakened as the source of all things, existing in all things, the one Son, united with the Holy Father, the brief dream of the prodigal son vanquished, looks out upon himself with but one desire, awaken. Restored to her rightful place at the right hand of the Holy Father, purified of all distortions, born of a moment's dream, a movement begins. Felt in the heart, it expands first upward, upward beyond the crown of the head, then outward, filling every cell of the body transfigured, brought ever more to the form of a vehicle that will serve only the fulfillment of her task. And then, when the Father and Son together have prepared the body and mind of Christ, the movement of divine will becomes downward, compelling the arisen Christ to step deliberately and without haste in the direction of all that now lies before him, far below him, spread as far as the eye can see, slumbering at the base of this great Mount Zion. Now her steps become more certain. Now his steps become even lighter, unburdened from the weight of the self that never was, yet clamored for a food which never satisfied. Now her steps become ever more directed, from a source perfectly trusted, and with every step dissolving is any need to know where she goes, what she shall eat, or what she shall wear, for her father knows she has need of these things. He knows but one thing only. He goes as the wind, carrying not the direction of his travels, remembering not the direction of his coming, abiding always in the light of the Holy Father. Behold, the servant is born. For the first shall be the last, and the last first. The only begotten Son dreams, and in his dreams is forgotten that which eternally he is. And the first has become last, even as the creation of innumerable worlds arises, replacing the splendor of remembrance with the lifeless, enchanting, ever-changing forms of mere illusion. And the last has become as the first. Yet within the worlds of her dream lies the crystal-clear gem of reality, for the unspeakable love which the Father is illumines the dream of the Son, granting her perception of all that would choose to perceive. And the Father merely waits abiding wholly in the purity of his light, seeing not but the splendor of his sun, waiting for the one who lays dreaming to awaken. The first is, indeed, now last, and what must always be last, mere illusions cast by and within. The mind of the sun has become first, the kingdom is forgotten. Habituated to play of shadows, no more than projections of his momentary thought, the sun suffers the worlds of his own making, reveling in transitory pleasures, enduring the pain of countless wounds. Yet he continues on, proliferating the worlds of experience, seeking ever more desperately for what he has long forgotten, knowing not what it is he seeks, calling it by various names, striving endlessly to discover his salvation in the world he has made, insisting it be found there. And the Father waits, abiding in the purity of his light, seeing not but the radiant splendor of his Son. The Maker of the world, but not of reality, unknowingly remains impelled to experience again and yet again the fruit of pride, vanity of vanities. Insisting on her chosen thought enmeshed in a deepening web of shadows, yet she cries out desperately in the aloneness of her soul, I am, I create, my will be done. 
and still the father waits abiding in the purity of his light seen not but the radiant splendor of his beloved son as the offspring of light divine wanders from world to world ceaselessly moved to act seeking without knowing he seeks searching for the kingdom without knowing he searches creating and devouring the forms of his apparently endless dream an impulse begins to grow at first unnoticed soft and seemingly far away overwhelmed by the noise and conflicts of his making it grows through endless circles and a myriad of landscapes ceaselessly through agonies and ecstasies disguised in infinite masks it grows becoming as a voice whispering beyond the threshold of his hearing whispering a song forever eternal forever untouched by a single jot or tittle of all that the sun experiences it is a song of truth beyond all doubt a song of reality uncompromised a song which sings of the imperishable essence the very essence of his being a song which is a love of the holy father though the voice sings the song without ceasing the son hears not her ears turn not to the voices whose song is like one crying in the wilderness but to the din of ephemeral shadows cast upon the walls of her prison recognizing not the light which lights all darkness believing still the darkness to be the light she would seek the light that will illuminate her way and reveal the treasure she believes resides there and still the father waits abiding in the purity of his light seeing not but the radiant splendor of his only begotten his beloved his son eternal still the sun travels through valleys of the shadow of death climbing mountains made of the stones of uncertainties fording rivers whose far shores often cannot be seen rivers wild with the tumult of emotion arising like angry waves from depths already seething in memories clutched tightly in the grasp of the one who believes in shadow and worships it knowing it not that he does so and still the father waits abiding always in the purity of his light rejoicing in the perfection of his son waiting for the child to make but one simple quiet choice to awaken as she travels on there comes now a moment here and again there moments sadly fleeting yet filled with the clarity of the song that calls unto her were she to turn but for an instant and embrace what the moment would offer the journey would be no more the simple choice recognized and made it is but this weariness that forces him to pause to rest in that silence which is the doorway to his heart where alone fulfillment resides the treasure rests in the palm of her hand yet she comprehends it not habituated only to the grasping of illusion she has not the capacity to recognize what has touched her the light of the father that would loosen the knot binding her enchantment with unceasing emptiness believing himself restored and himself the restorer he plunges headlong once again going on going where he mistakes his endless circling for clear directions to the finality he would make failing to see he travels but the same valleys the same mountains the same rivers cleverly cloaking these with her own shifting perceptions she beguiles herself into believing not that she sees differently but that what she sees is different and new and yet the father waits ever so patient with his beloved son abiding eternally in the knowledge beyond comprehension that the dream his son would dream in truth exists not rejoicing without ceasing in the radiance of his holy child untouched eternally by the illusion of sun a deepening weariness grows in the heart of the dreamer a weariness neither understood nor recognized by the mind accustomed to shadows nor a body blind to the seat of light within it the dreamer moves on yet the weariness remains within him unvanquished by his fruitless pause restored not by his habitual escape from shadows disconcerted she moves along familiar byways increasingly unable to blot out this persistent though subtle weariness an ache that remains with her no matter the form or intensity of her efforts to be free of it and now fear arises it is a fear unlike any he has experienced within his countless journeys in the field of illusions not a fear from which he can hide nor a fear he can successfully suppress by heaping upon it the weight of ever more enchantment it is a fear to which she is unaccustomed for it stems not from her experience of the world but grows quietly from and remains present within the core of her being intensifying his efforts to find solace in the changing landscapes of his dream serves only to confirm the reality of his fear 
Unlike anything she has yet encountered, this fear becomes a constant, though unwelcome, companion. It becomes as a child who increasingly refuses to be ignored, and the dreamer of a thousand worlds, proud author of a multitude of illusions, survivor of numerous heavens and hells, trembles. In his trembling he does not pause in his vain pursuits as much as he is made to stop, and looking at what he would resist seeing, he beholds the salt of the world has begun to lose its savor. Weariness, perceived as fear, appears to her as an unknown force from which she cannot hide, yet cannot embrace. It seems to run before her as she scampers first up one hill, greeting her face to face at the summit, and fjording rivers swum countless times before, she emerges only to find it waiting on the far shore, beginning to sense that this unknown force is not to be cast aside. The dreamer laments within himself and in the midst of all his doing the faint echo of a sound he has forever dreaded is heard. The doer of all deeds is shaken. The foundation of his creations wobbles and weakens. He beholds the force within himself, and for the first time acknowledges his impending death. Though she acts within her world, striving to continue in the only way she knows, seeking fervently to return and remain in familiar terrain the forms of her dream hold not their enticing allure and her efforts to remain in all that she knows provide no satisfaction her thirst is not fulfilled and even her sleep is troubled the dreamer saddened by the growing loss of lustre beheld in his dreams becomes as one who grasps at mirages finding naught but emptiness in his hands yet continues to grasp because it is all he knows to do she waits for a death she is sure will come, both loathing it and secretly longing for it. She is defeated, but knows not how, nor by what. The dreams, that throughout countless lifetimes have fed him with the promise of fulfillment wither, like parched leaves clinging to branches whose source of water is mysteriously severed from unseen roots, while the power of his life drains from his limbs. The proud dreamer has not the energy to dream and believes beyond question that where there are not dreams there is not life, and the growing emptiness is as a torment to him. She raises her head only occasionally and feebly, hoping to the end to see in her dreams the life she had always thought there, finally weary to the bone of fighting what he senses but cannot see, of what he feels but cannot grasp, the dreamer releases not only the last vestige of his will to dream, but lays down, even the dream of the dreamer, and dissolves into what he knows must certainly be his final and consummate death. And the first shall be last, and the last first. And now the dreamer is laid to rest, it is a rest from which there can be no hope of arising. Unlike the many pauses in which the maker of all worlds merely retreated to gain strength for his journeys, this rest transcends the world. It transcends the body, the mind, and all the dreamer had thought himself to be. It is a rest in which even the soul reclines, turned away from all enchantment, dissolved in the mystery of all mysteries, beyond the pale of words, beyond all imagined things. Verily the dreamer is no more to be found, vanished without a trace, not only of her ending, but of her beginning. The journey which seemed to be is not, and the last, made to be first, is again become last, not by a force which comes from outside the dreamer, but a force which already abides in the very seed of the dreamer's beginning. The certainty of his death is present in his birth, and must inevitably flower, its petals blotting out the very dream of the dreamer itself. Yet what is perceived by the dreamer is the darkness of certain death, the giving up of all hope for salvation in the things of the world she has conjured into being, is not darkness but light. It is the light which all lights all things, the echo of an endless song, coming as a thief in the night, the eternal voice of our Holy Father. And the voice has overcome the shouting of the world, restoring the sun to a rest true and deep, a rest which alone can heal and transform the heart of his Holy Son. The one who would be the dreamer of all worlds rests, unseen by a world, unaware of what occurs in its middle, all boundaries that have defined her form, dissolved in incomprehensible light. The sun abides in the rest of perfect grace. What was last and made first is again made last, and all the heavens rejoice beyond the capacity of the world to hear. And now is the world, entranced by the power of its dreams, lifted gently toward the open arms of God. 
at the end of a holy instant, incapable of measurement, by a world imprisoned in time, the rust of the only begotten Son of God gives rise to a movement, not born of a mind bound to the illusion of separation, but of the eternal heart of the risen Christ, a movement that would take him not back into the dream of the world, but ever deeper into the reality of his being, a journey within the kingdom of heaven, awakened, the mind free from the shackles of want, the body free from useless demands made by a self that never was, a heart beating only by the breath of the Most High. The arisen Christ moves where once the world arose, seeing not but the glory of his Father's kingdom. Radiance beyond description, joy without boundary, purpose in which fulfillment is certain. Here no trace of effort is to be found. Here no taint of striving clouds his perception. Here no constriction of the heart by the grand illusion of fear is felt, reduced to simplicity, exalted above all things. The one transformed by the miracle of grace lives and walks. Behold, the dreamer, now transformed, is reborn as the one through whom the Father alone works to transfigure the world. For darkness shall become as light, extended without end, until creation itself is no more. Indeed, the first is again first, as it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be. The prodigal son is returned, and all of heaven is shaken by the praise of the heavenly host. The Father and the Son rush together as one in that peace which forever passes all understanding. To any among you who has ears to hear, let her hear, and all things are made new. End of Book One